Good morning, Desert Chapel. And good morning to everyone who is online with us. Welcome to service this morning. It's a beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning here in Apache Junction. I uh, just want to remind you that the September mission is gently used, or new if you prefer, blankets and pillows for the um, clothing closet. Uh, I would like to announce that on Wednesday, 9-11, the Mountain View Lutheran Church is having a remembrance service at 11 o'clock, so 9-11 at 11 o'clock. Um, they are at 2122 Goldfield Road, if you know where that is. Um, also, I want to remind you that the first Thursday of October, which is October 10th, we are going to start choir again, and that's at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We also are starting the lay servant ministry classes October 18th from 4 to 7 and October 19th from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And that will be right here at the church. I want to remind you also that the rummage sale is November 15th. And if you have uh, items you'd like to donate to that, you need to see Iris McKinney or Nancy January. And I heard a rumor that if you need things picked up, Nancy would be willing to come and pick them up for you. There will be a board meeting on the 18th of this month. So, and that's at 4 o'clock if anyone is interested in coming to that. And just a save the date reminder for the All Church Conference on November 26th. And I think that's all that I have this morning. Do you have any? All righty then, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
And the people said, Amen. Thank you too, Michael. He just amazes me. I don't know how many, I never could have taken enough lessons to play like that, no matter what. <laughs> Good morning, friends. If you are able, would you please stand and join in the call to worship? <clears throat> Those who trust in God are like the mountains, immovable and abiding. God shelters the people today and for eternity. Rich or poor, God creates us to pursue justice and to care for one another. Be a blessing, O oh God, to those who are good and upright in heart. God calls us to be rich in faith, to honor our heritage as heirs of the kingdom. We are blessed when we share our blessings, that peace may become the people. Amen. Uh, the opening hymn is uh, uh, in the uh, Faith We Sing book, the little small uh, Faith We Sing book, and it's number 2149. <laughs>
please join with me in the opening prayer. Holy One, we call upon your name, for we know that your name and favor are more precious than human riches. You hate wickedness and abhor the neglect of your people. You call us to righteousness to reach out to others with justice and mercy. You teach us right from wrong, that we may truly live in your grace. In the shadow of that grace, we offer compassion and mercy to others. Abide with us this day, that we may serve you forevermore. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Desert Chapel. Good morning. My name is Philip Tesarek. I'm the pastor here at Desert Chapel, and we are blessed that you are worshiping here with us today in the sanctuary or online. And today, this time, is a joy and a blessing that we come together and that we now enter, an, in, enter into a time of prayer where we lift up our joys and praises for those around us, as well as our concerns and our fears and those who need healing. And we pray for those in our congregation, we pray for those in our family, our friends, and our community, and we pray for those that we may never meet. The week has been a challenging one. Many of you have read the news about the school shooting in Georgia, where both children and teachers lost their lives and they were wounded. We lift up those families, law enforcement. We lift up the community. There are many things which we do not know and understand about the why, but what we do know as a community of faith is that there were innocent children and teachers who lost their lives, and there are people suffering and grieving. And we lift up all of them in our prayers today and going forward. Many of you have followed the email about Marilyn Schultz. She has had a challenging week. She had a minor heart attack. She uh, went in for uh, some, some other medical procedures, but she did have a stent, and she is doing better. So we do have good news, a praise to share, that she is doing better, and she is in cardiac rehab. And uh, I had a chance to chat with her before the stent. She was in good spirits, and I know there are many of you watching over her today as well. So we lift that up as a prayer and a, and a concern and a praise. We also lift up Thelma Harris, who fell and broke her kneecap, and she was in rehab. I did have a chance to chat with her, and she is in good spirit. She is going through the process. I think her sister is going to be with her, and uh, she sends her greetings and joys to all of you as well. So we will be looking forward to her healing and coming back with us as soon as possible. We continue to pray for Jim Edwards, who is uh, here with us today. We are blessed. He is continuing a recovery from COVID, and we are praying that he continues on the path of healing. We continue to pray for James Lopez, the little baby who was born three months early and who's been in the NICU. Uh, we are praying and for uh, peace and healing and strength and guidance for his parents. We continue to pray for Bill Gowans, who has uh, been waiting a long time for a much needed hernia surgery and who has now moved to the critical list. We continue to pray for Sally Steiner's daughter-in-law, who was hospitalized. We pray for Kathy's friend Arlene, who has been diagnosed with cancer in multiple areas. We continue to pray for Nancy January's mother and the after effects of a mitral heart valve replacement that has not been working as it should. We continue to pray for Rosemary Glithrow, the uh, wife of retired Pastor Ian, who is recovering from that serious car accident. We pray for Marilyn Schultz's friend Gay, who has been diagnosed with terminal cancer. We continue to pray for Greg, who is Peggy's son, who is dealing with multiple medical issues. And we continue to lift up Lori Wilburn, the daughter of Jim Edwards, as she continues her struggle with stage four non-smoker lung cancer. Let us bow our heads. Almighty and loving God, our great healer, we, we come to you today with mixed emotions and feelings. We do not understand 
the evil that happened in Georgia. And yet we grieve with the families who lost children and their mothers and fathers. We do not understand the whys, but we as Christians and people of love lift up those families and communities and grieve with them and pray with them. We ask for a world in which this does not happen again. Lord, we pray for our family and friends and loved ones who could not be with us today, who are in hospitals or rehab, care homes, hospice, who are homebound. Lord, we love them, we miss them, and we pray that they feel that love as they continue on their paths to recovery. Lord, we lift up those who do not have enough food or adequate cooling in the continued heat. Though we come together as a community to feed and clothe them, we know that there is suffering. We know that there are needs that are not met. And we pray for pathways to help those meet their needs to have adequate food and cooling. Loving God, we walked into this sanctuary today with joys. We also walked in with concerns and fears buried deep in our hearts. We now take time to lift those silently in prayer to you. patient and loving Lord, you know us so well. We are fascinated by healing and can talk all day about the miracles, but sometimes we do not understand the compassion of Christ. We often say, just heal us, or just make me rich, just make things go better at work, or other such deals, and then we promise our faithfulness and our witness. But sometimes in our hearts, we just don't get it. Please forgive us, Lord, when our greed or fear get in the way of understanding. Help us to know the transformational power of your love. Get us ready to be faithful witnesses to you in all that we say and do. And we lift this in Jesus' name as we pray. Amen. Now let us come together as confident children of Christ, as a community of believers. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The first reading is from James, chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, Keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not a accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? 
Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. The second reading is from Psalms 146, 3 through 10. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please stand if you're able for the hymn of reflection, Yesu, Yesu. It's in the United Methodist hymnal, number 432, uh, verses 1 through 4. Thank you. Please be seated. Our
our text today brings us to the doorstep of one of the biggest debates in Christianity. Are we saved by faith alone, or are we required to pair our faith with real actions? On a cursory read, two of the well-known titans of the New Testament, Paul and James, they appear to disagree on these fundamental truths. Did they know each other? Probably. Did they disagree? Was there a feud? Maybe. Since we're talking about long-running feuds, I thought we'd honor that with a few other famous dramatic quarrels in history. There was the Montagues and the Capulets, for those of you that read Romeo and Juliet. You know, Shakespeare actually took that from a story from a 1562 verse by an author named Arthur Brooke, and it was based on two real families in 13th century Italy, the Montagues and the Capulets who were fighting over political supremacy. If you've read the play or seen the movie, you know it doesn't end very well for their children. We have Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. Both were founding fathers of the United States, and they were both very bitter political rivals. Alexander Hamilton went on to become the Secretary of the Treasury, and Aaron Burr, the Vice President under Thomas Jefferson, Burr was actually the grandson of the famous theologian Jonathan Edwards. If you've watched the musical Hamilton, you know that things don't go well for Hamilton in the eventual pistol duel that ends that conflict. We had Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. They were competitive act actresses for the, uh, the silver screen, the golden age of movies. They competed for both movies and husbands both. And apparently they never liked each other. Betty Davis is quoted as saying, Miss Crawford is a movie star and I'm an actress. Joan died in 1977. Betty passed away in 1989 without any resolution to their generation-long feud. And then there, if any of you follow modern music and gossip, there is the ongoing rift between rap star Kanye West and pop star Taylor Swift. Apparently that started in 2009 when Kanye interrupted her acceptance speech at a music award show. If anyone in this congregation actually understands that feud, please see me after service and you can explain it to me. <laughs> For 200 years, uh, drama sold newspapers and magazines. Later it brought viewers to reality television and now it brings people to social media who compete for your clicks in your view so they can sell ads. Drama and arguments, they get attention. Our text from the Epistle of James has been described as one of the most famous or infamous passages in the New Testament. Did the Apostle Paul, a significant author of the New Testament, and James, a lesser known author of one of the epistles, did they dare to publicly disagree? James has been a hotly debated book since the very early days of the Christian church. Who was it authored by? When was it written? Our best information says it was authored by James, the brother of Jesus, who, by the way, did not initially support Jesus or believe in him, but whose heart was changed. James became the leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem before he was martyred. Some accounts say that he was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple by the Pharisees themselves. Personally, that sounds a little dramatic. But in case you're also confused by the name James, you're not alone because there are no less than five Jameses mentioned in the New Testament. The Epistle of James is a very short book. It's merely five chapters, and it's just a few pages. So it's an easy Sunday afternoon read. And it is a short and powerful guide to the righteous living. In chapter 2, James is telling us that our faith must be coupled with actions and deeds. In James chapter 2 from the message, modern translation, this reads like this. Dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere in this if you learn all the right words but never do anything? Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? For instance, you come upon an old friend dressed in rags and half-starved and say, Good morning, friend. 
be clothed in Christ, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup. Where does that get you? Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? I can already hear one of you agreeing by saying, sounds good, you take care of the faith department, I'll handle the works department. But not so fast. You can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I can show you my faith apart from my works. Faith and works, work and faith, they fit together hand in glove. It's from the message, modern translation. When I read that scripture in preparation for today, the first thing that kept coming back to my mind was my father's frequent lecture that actions speak louder than words. Now, as any of the lectures my father gave me, especially when I was a teenager, his timing was never welcome, and it always occurred after an event that I didn't want to discuss. Somehow, despite my rebellious nature, that phrase has always stuck with me. But James was saying that we need both actions and words. Both. We're called to believe in Christ, to have rock-solid faith in Christ's message of love and forgiveness, while also being the hands and feet of God. Talking the talk, walking the walk, as people say today. You know, it turns out that John Wesley, who's the founder of Methodism, he was a huge believer in James's teachings. There is a reason, there's no accident, why Methodists for hundreds of years have been known for mission work. In other words, the deeds of delivering God's love in a very physical and tangible way. Starting schools and hospitals in places where there were none. Sending teams of people into faraway places to help people recover from hurricanes and earthquakes and wars. Feeding the hungry and clothing the poor. John Wesley called it holy living. Wesley convened small groups amongst his peers to study the scriptures, pray, and hold each other accountable as to what they did and did not do in the previous week. So how does that sound today? Imagine meeting every week and being called to report on your deeds and your misdeeds, on the love that you delivered and the missed opportunities. Here's one description of John Wesley's structured life and ministry. At Oxford, a small band of Christians, Wesley was mentoring, he shared his longing for holiness. For Wesley and his friends, holiness included a complete yielding of one's life to God, a desire to become like Christ in heart and actions, act of compassion for others, and a resolution to live one's life for God's glory. Among the ways that Wesley pursued this quest for holiness was rising at four or five o'clock in the morning for private prayer, fasting two days a week until mid-afternoon, meeting with others to study the Bible and other Christian writings, and holding each other accountable. Wesley and his friends attended public worship and he received the Eucharist weekly. They read and they meditated upon scripture daily. They actively pursued acts of compassion and mercy for the poor, the prisoners, the elderly, and they sought to achieve lives of simplicity. Wesley wanted not just to believe the Christian faith, nor only to understand it just intellectually, Wesley wanted holiness. He wanted God. He wanted to become like Christ in heart and actions. Now, we don't need to look very far to see, see this close by to us today. Every Saturday here at Desert Chapel, our community feast and our clothing closet cares for our community by cooking food and handing out clothes. This is part of a rich Wesleyan 
history of this congregation. This is how we are woven into the tapestry of James and John Wesley's teachings. I alluded to a disagreement with the Apostle Paul earlier. So what was I talking about there? In several of Paul's writings, Paul says that we are saved by faith alone, not by works. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Paul said similar things in his letter to the Romans and his letter to the Galatians. We believe we are saved by faith. We believe that we are given God's grace, God's love and forgiveness freely, without us having to earn it, without any merit due from our actions. Next time we recite the Apostles' Creed, listen for those words. So did Paul think that we did not have to do anything? No. If you study Paul's teachings, Paul is referring to works of the law. In other words, people who claim they were saved and all good because they followed the letter of each and every religious law and custom set forth by man, and yet they had no faith in their hearts. The majority of Paul's audiences were former Gentiles and pagans, and there was a feud or schism in the early church between them and the Jews who had converted to Christianity, but who insisted that everyone should continue to follow the purity laws and rituals, such as circumcision, that the Mosaic Covenant of the Old Testament had laid out. And Paul said emphatically, no, we're all Christians, unified under Christ, and that those rituals and laws and ceremonies were a thing of the past. So what we, once we get under the surface of James and Paul, we really have no feud or disagreement. If you have any doubt, let's look at Jesus' teachings. Jesus spoke in action verbs. If you've ever taken a class on resume writing, they tell you to speak of what you have done with action verbs. Because Jesus didn't speak passively. He didn't waste words. Jesus was what we call an efficient communicator. In Jesus' teachings, Jesus said, Go preach the gospel. Feed the hungry. Love your neighbor. Heal the sick. Clothe the poor. Those are actions. In other words, deeds. And that's what just Jesus commands us to do. There's no lack of clarity in that. But what if you can't do something? What if you're stuck at home in a hospital or a hospice or otherwise ill? Does that disqualify us from salvation? I've had people ask me over the years, what if I'm not physically or financially capable of going on those big ticket mission trips? You know, the ones that go to Haiti or Africa or they do the post-hurricane cleanup in the Gulf Coast. What if I can't do those? You know what's not in today's scripture? A quota of deeds and actions, a minimum number or a minimum size of the deeds. There is no litmus test in there about what's a worthy deed in the eyes of God. It doesn't exist. It's not there in the text. It's kind of funny how our minds tend to fill in the blanks when stuff isn't there. God knows our abilities and our limitations better than we do. So what could you do? Well, you can earnestly pray for those in need. If you don't get the weekly prayer list, please put your name and email on one of the prayer request cards and drop it in the offering plate later so we can add you to the weekly prayer list because we are a praying congregation. You can call those in need of prayer and just say, hey, hi, I'm calling to say hi. How are you doing? May I pray with you? Those are two things that you can do that don't require any traveling or lifting heavy objects. Prayer and praying for others is a means of grace. It's honest Christian work. The Catholic priest Martin Luther, who started the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther said, Man is justified by faith alone, 
but not by faith that is alone. We are called to be a community of Christ, an extended family who prays and lives and loves and acts together. Dead faith, dead faith is an intellectual acceptance of certain truths about Christ, but that is lacking a true belief in the gift of salvation and the sacrifice of Christ. And we are called to have living faith. Now, I don't know who wrote the book of James. We may never truly know who wrote it. But it is a powerful message how we as Christians should be living our lives. And 2,000 years later, it is still very relevant to us. I doubt there was an actual feud between Paul and James. There probably never was. But I'm sure it made for some interesting dialogue and conversation and maybe some awesome dramatic arguments in seminaries and monasteries of the time because both of them give us important messages. If we restate it, James tells us that the spirit of faith is deeds. The Reverend Douglas Walker tells us this story. Reverend Walker says, I have two plants in my office. One is alive and the other is artificial. The artificial one is a very low-maintenance plant with only an occasional dusting required. It never blooms and it never gives any signs of life, even though it is green. The living one, it shows all the signs of life. It needs water and it sometimes the leaves bloom, but other times the leaves turn brown and it must be trimmed. A cursory glance at the plants will not reveal which one is living and which one is plastic. A closer and more thorough examination does reveal which plant is the living one. He says, some people in the church resemble the two plants in my office. While some are genuine and alive, others only give the appearance of spiritual life, but in reality are fake. Let us never be confused with the plastic two-dimensional plants in Pastor Walker's office. Let us live together our faults and our mistakes, our blemishes. Let us live together with all of that in the presence of the risen Christ, bringing with us deep faith and loving actions that extend the grace of God to those who need it. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. It is the second Sunday of the month, and we now partake in that very special and fun tradition of noisy change here at Desert Chapel, where your pastor gives you the blessing, encouragement, to go and be as noisy in church as possible. On the second Sunday, we take up two collections. The first is for our apportionments to the United Methodist Church, and this is a great Sunday to talk about that because this is where the deeds of the Methodist Church meet the ground. This is our apportionment, our tithe to the Methodist Church that goes toward our volunteers in mission, our, our lay servant ministry classes, where the hands and feet of Methodists like you across the entire world are helping others. Let us commence noisy change. I now invite our ushers to come forward to receive our regular tithes and our offerings.
Loving Creator, we dedicate these offerings with hearts guided by your wisdom and grace. As we gather on this beautiful Sunday, may our gifts embody the teachings of Proverbs, spreading honor, kindness, and justice to all. Use these offerings to uplift those in need, fostering hope and peace in our community. May we live out your wisdom in our actions and our generosity. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing for our final hymn, number 140, Great is Thy Faithfulness. I bring glad tidings. Bev Wren has personally guaranteed that we have cooler weather coming one week from today. She tells us that we have a, a high of 88 in one week, right? Yeah, 69. And a low of 69. Amazing, amazing. So Bev is bringing us glad tidings of weather. Thank you, Bev. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that and sincerely hoping that Bev's prognostication is accurate. Our message today is that we are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. There's not a quota, there's not a minimum, there's not a minimum spec, but we are all called to both be faithful and do. So as you go out into that world, that beautiful Arizona Sunday, go out and do. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his countenance to look upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord make his face to shine down upon you and bring you peace. Go forth. Amen.